The last video we covered coordinate geometry. This video we're moving on to some more advanced topics. Starting off floor and ceiling function. The floor of a number is simply the greatest integer that's less than or equal to it. And be very careful here. Let's say you have negative 3.5. The floor of negative 3.5 is not negative 3, but negative 4. Because negative 4 is less than negative 3.5 the greatest integer less than or equal to. And ceiling of a number is just the opposite. The smallest integer greater than or equal to. And similarly, for this case, the ceiling of negative 3.5 is not going to be negative four, but in this case, negative three. Okay, now the fractional part is just the, this can be defined as X minus the floor of the number. So for example, let's say you have negative 3.3. Let's, let's take a positive example first. 2.7, the fractional part, is just going to be 0 0.7. Now let's say we have negative 3.3. The fractional part is not 0 0.3, be careful. The floor of negative 3.3 is negative 4. Negative 3.3 minus negative 4, 0.7. So this has a fractional part of 0.7. Be careful with these negative values here. Okay, so here are some common techniques we're going to be using in these problems. One is the substitution. X equals to the floor of X plus fractional part X. The second technique is to use it to find an inequality. So let, what we know about floor of X is that it's going to be, floor, the number is going to be bigger than floor of X and less than floor of X plus 1. For example, 3.5 is going to be greater than or equal to the floor, which is 3, and less than 4, which is the floor plus 1. And the third technique, which is the most intuitive sometimes, is to graph your equations. And you can use graph paper, but I'm not sure. I think it's not allowed in the AMCs anymore. I'm not entirely sure about that. But you can still graph it even with the regular paper. And you can look for intersection points to look for your equation solutions. Okay, now let's take a look at some examples, because this is... This, pro this thing can often get very tricky. There can be many very tricky problems in floor and ceiling, using floor and ceiling. How many of the first 1,000 positive integers can be expressed in this form? The floor of 2x plus the floor of 4x plus the floor of 6x plus the floor of 8x. So the first thing to notice here is x is not necessarily an integer. It's just the real, it's just any real number. So it really can be anything. So let's just take a look. We're looking for positive integer values of this quantity over here. Let's just plug in a few values into this expression so we can try and get a hang of what's going on in this problem. Starting with zero. When x equals zero, this quantity over here, is just the floor of zero plus the floor of zero, so on, which is just zero, okay? Now, what about when x is 1? When x is 1, then it's just the floor of 2, plus the floor of 4, plus the floor of 6, plus the floor of 8. And all of this is just 20. We're asked to find first 1,000 positive integers. So intuitively, you might be like, what about x equals 2? Well, notice that everything is scaled up. This becomes floor of 4, this becomes floor of 8, floor of 12, and floor of 16. So this is just going to be 40. And in general, for any integer, it's just going to be 20 times n by just scaling up. So is the answer just all the multiples of 20 from 0 to 1,000, which is just 50? No, because x is a real number. It doesn't necessarily have to be an integer. If you go all the way to like x equals 50, that would be a thousand. So if the problem just said integers, our answer would just be 50, 20, 40, 60, all the way to a thousand. But it isn't. So we need to look at analysis. And the key thing to notice here is let's just take a look. We already have the integer values. So now let's take a look at what fractions we need for x, 
the fractional part of x such that we get an integer such that we get a value from this expression. So x equals 0, 0. This is 20. Let's first look at how many values from 0 to 20 we can actually get when we use any value between 0 and 1, not necessarily just 0 or 1. And to do this, we need to see when a new number is formed. Because so let's just draw like a number, a nice little number line here. So x goes from 0 all the way till 1. And we have that quantity over there, the floor expression. It's going to go from 0 to 20. Let's draw it big. We're going to need a lot of space here for this one. Okay, I'll, I'll just move all of this down. So the key thing we want to look at is when this thing will increase. Because let's say I increase x by 0 0.0001. And let's say x is like 0.5. And let's say I increase it by 0 0.0001. It's not going to form a new value. Because the floor of a number kind of negates some of the extra value of x. Because we're taking the floor of it. So we need to find out, this can go from, as x goes from 0 to 1, this can go from 0 to 2. As x goes from 0 to 1, this goes from 0 to 4. As x goes from 0 to 1, this goes from 0 to 6. And this goes from 0 to 8. So we really need to find out, let's say, if this can go from 0 to 8, when does it hit the next integer? Because if, it goes, if this quantity goes from 6.7 to 6.8, it's not changing the floor value. But if it goes from 6 to 7, let's say, now it's one more. Because now the floor won't just remove that extra part, the extra decimal point increase. So when, first of all, when does this, when does floor of 2 of x increase? Floor of 2 of x increases when x moves on to the next half. So when x when x reaches a new half. So basically you have you have your x is ranging from here to here. When x is 0, floor of 2 of x is 0. When x is 0 0.1, floor of 2x is still 0 0.1. All the way even at 0 0.4, floor of 2 of x is still 0 because 2x is 0 0.8. But as soon as you get to 0 0.5, now all of a sudden the floor value is 1. And as soon as you get to 1, all of a sudden the floor value is 2. So as you range x from 0 to 1, this quantity over here is only going to increase when x reaches half or 1. Okay, so now the rest is kind of similar, actually. Floor of 4 of x increases when x reaches any multiple of 1 fourth. So 1 fourth, 2 fourth, 3 fourth, and 1. So I'll just write 1 fourth, 2 fourth, 3 fourth, 4 fourths. And then floor of 6x increases when it's just like 1 sixth, 2 sixth, 3 sixths etc. I'm not going to write it all. And then 8x, of course, is just going to increase when x reaches 1 8, 2 8, etc. So now the question just becomes, but the thing is, is we can't just say, oh, every time it hits one of these values, it's going to reach a new, every time x reaches a new milestone, kind of, it's going to be one more value. Because there's some points, like let's say, I don't know, 1 half, which floor of 2x will increase, but also floor of 4x will increase, and also floor of 8x will increase. So there's some commonalities between their different milestones, per se. So now we need to figure out when are these milestones. So for what values of x, what values of x will result in any one of these terms increasing? So kind of like the union of all these, basically, is what we're looking for here is in any one of these, x will increase. So what is the union of all of these lists, basically? 
So clearly, this is all the multiples of 1 8. It's going to include the multiples of 1 4th and 1 half. So that we can just write down. Let's just write down all of them. 1 8, 2 8, 3 8, 4 8, 5, 6, 7, and 8. But there's also some additional values over here. And you know, I'm, I'm actually going to convert this to 24 because then we'll deal with the common denominator. So I'm just going to make this 3, 3 over 24. I'll make the 6 over 24, 9 over 24, etc. And the reason I'm doing this is later we're going to add the, the other values that are multiples of 1, 6. And then we want to have a common denominator just for looking at it and seeing really what values are common and between the two lists. So if we add all the multiples of 1, 6, there's going to be some unique values that are not multiples of 1, 8. So let's say 1 6, which is 4 over 24. Let's, let's use a different color. So 1 6. Now 2 6 is just going to be 8 over 24. Now 3 6 is 12 over 24, but we already got that. That's an overlap. 4 6 is 16 over 24. We can add that. 5 6, 20 over 24. And 6 6, again, we've already got that. So these are the union of all the values for which x, the, this quantity, will increase. So it increases at all of these points. So x was 0 originally. Now after this, after 3 over 24, it's going to become something else. So the thing is, there's a, there's a clever trick here. So one way you can do is you can be like, okay, at this point, it's going to increase by 3 because or at this point, it's going to increase by 1 because it's only a multiple of 1, 8. And at this point, it's only going to increase by 1. But then at this point, it's going to increase by 2 because it's a multiple of 1, 8 and 1, 4. And you can just keep going through this entire list saying each value is going to increase by this much. Or you can be clever and notice that at, originally we start with 0. And for each of these values, we increase by some amount. We don't know what. And afterwards, after we're done increasing, we're left with 20. So we increase, 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 increase by some amount. It's not always going to be 1, sometimes 2, sometimes 3, sometimes even 4 for this here. We're going to eventually get 20. But the point is, the trick is, is we're going to hit 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 unique values. This was, let's just, let's just, it's going to produce a list of 12 different values from 0 to 20 because there's 12 times when it's increasing. Some values will be skipped because let's say over here, we increase by 2. So we're going to skip the value in the middle. But in total, because we increase 12 times, we're going to get 12 different numbers. Well, if you count 0, then 13, but 0 doesn't really count because we're looking at positive in it. So from 1 to 20, we have 12 positive integers. Now, what about from 20 or from 1 to 20, we have 12 positive integers as x ranges from 0 to 1. Now, what about when x ranges from 1 to 2? Now, this value will range from 21 to 40. And there's a cool thing you can notice. Again, we'll get 12 integers. And why is that? Well, because it's literally the exact same logic. Except now, instead of this being 0 and this being 20, we've got 20 here and 40 here. And each time here, or it's, it's going to be the same thing, except each of these terms, this term will be plus 2, this term plus 4, this term plus 6, and this term plus 8. And then it's just going to be the same thing except with the extra 20 because of the extra one value for x. So we're going to get 12 integers and they're all going to be scaled up by plus 20. And we can continue this logic again and again, all the way until 581 to 600 or whoops, 981 to 1000, which will have 12 integers. 
So in total, we've got this kind of 20 groups of 50 groups of 20. And each of those groups, each of those groups of 20 integers has 12 that work. Their answer is just 50 times 12, 600. This was a, a, a great problem. The, the trick here was noticing that trying to look for a pattern at first. Okay, when it's zero, it's zero. When it's one, it's 20 and so on. But then it's real number. So we have to look for the values in between. And then we kind of had this cool idea. When will each of these terms increase? Because just because you increase X doesn't necessarily mean this whole thing is going to increase. There's different milestones that we looked at. And in total, we found there's 12 milestones where this thing, the sum will increase. And, and that's going to be true for every single range from, of X of one value. So from zero to one, we have 12 valid solutions from one to two, 12 valid solutions. And from what would this be all the way until 49 to 50, that would be 12 valid solutions as well because of the symmetry and how it's going to be essentially the same scenario, except scaled up because of the increased value of X. And then we just solved at the end, found the number of solutions. Okay, now let's take a look at this problem. And this is a really cool problem, which utilizes another one of the techniques we covered in the beginning. So we already know what floor of X is. How many real numbers satisfy this equation? Got a floor here, huh? And imagine if this was just, if there was no floor here, imagine how easy this problem would be. But there is a floor here, and that's the tricky part. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna utilize our very, let's, let's rewrite this equation. X squared is 10,000 X minus floor of X. Why? Because I just factored out that. And as you can see here, we've got an X and floor of X, and we're kind of subtracting it. And this really motivates us to consider the substitution X equals floor of X plus uh, drawing a curly bracket is difficult. Fractional part of X. So this is just going to be 10,000 times the fractional part of X. This is, this is already 10 times simpler of an equation, right? We don't have floors anymore. We're just dealing with fractional parts. But because we, we made the substitution here, let's also substitute it over here because then we can deal with integers. The, the advantage of the substitution really is it allows you to break this arbitrary real number X, which is just really anything, it's really vague, into two parts, an integer, which is easy to work with, and some number that does not exceed one. And that's really the power of this, of this substitution. So X, let's substitute floor of X plus fractional part of X. Squared is 10,000 times this. And now here's the kind of the cool thing about fractional part, which is why we did this. It cannot ever exceed one. In fact, it has to be strictly less than one. So from this, we can actually see that this is going to be less than 10,000. Why? Because this thingy cannot exceed one. It's less than one. This is less than one. So the whole thing is less than 10,000. And now we can take the square root of both sides. We get four of X, plus fractional part of X is less than square root of 10,000, 100, or because it's negative, it's going to be greater than 100. So now we've got this really nice bound. And again, the key thing here is this thingy does not exceed 1. So now let's look at the idea here is we want to look at the possible values of the floor of X. What is the maximum and what is the minimum? And this gives us a really easy way to look at it. So let's look at the maximum first of all. The maximum of floor of X is just 99. And the minimum is going to be negative 100. 
Because remember, we're always adding something here. Negative 101, then it's going to be too small. But negative 100, and let's say we have something 0.5 here, now we're bigger than negative 100. So it's going to be between negative 100 and 99. But the question is, is there solutions for each one of them? So here's kind of the tricky part, which actually many people messed up during the contest on this year, is if is actually four of x being 99 doesn't have a solution, which is kind of crazy. Because you're like, oh yeah, it's, it's in this range. Why wouldn't it have a solution? And to do that, we're going to have to plug that back into our first equation here. So let's just down. Let's see which values for the floor of x have a solution and how many solutions there are. So let's, let's take a look when it's 99. We have 99 plus the fractional part of x. That thingy is going to be less than 100. And this negative 100. Or, no, 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 let's not. Okay, let, let's just keep it in, in our original form. This squared is equal to 10,000 that so the only the the key thing to notice here is let's just expand this for a moment this gives us 99 squared plus 2 times 99 times the floor of x and plus the or the fractional part of x squared and this is going to be 10 thousand times the fractional part of x so when this thing is called or really 99 can be anything i'm just using 99 as an example but the key thing here is that this 10,000 times the fractional part of x as the fractional part of x increases and increases this side is going to grow a lot this side is also going to become bigger but nowhere near as much Look, this is 198 times the, the fractional part of x. And this is just fractional part of x squared, which is not even 1 times the fractional part of x. So if you increase this quantity, this side will increase, but very little. This side is going to increase a lot. So the, the maximum value for, for fractional part of x, there isn't really a maximum, but it Cannot it can it has to be less than one. The only way this equation can be true is if fractional part of x is exactly one. Take a look. When fractional part of x is one, then this equation is true. We got ten thousand and ten thousand because hundred squared is equal to ten thousand. But fractional part of x can't be one. But what happens when you reduce the value of fractional part of x? Can go from zero to one. So let's say you just keep moving it down and down and down. This side is going to become a lot, lot smaller because fractional part of x, it's 10,000 times that. This side is only going to become a little bit smaller. And what's going to happen then? If one side becomes a lot smaller, other side a little bit smaller, they're not equal. So because fractional part of x cannot actually be 1, these two cannot actually be equal for a valid value of fractional part of x. So therefore, x equals 99 does not have a solution. Okay, so what about, what about all the other values? Negative 100, 298. Do they all have solutions? Let's see. So we do the same, the same logic here. We have, we'll, we'll expand it in general. We'll just expand it. So this thing is squared plus two. And the same exact principles that were true for 99 will hold here. And that is the right-hand side, as fractional part of x gets big, the right-hand side is going to go rapidly. The left-hand side, just a little bit. And we're, we're going to use the same principle that's going to help us solve for all the other cases.
Okay, so the thing to notice here is what happens when fractional part of x is zero? This side is tiny. And this side, well, this, this term is still going to be big. So when x is zero, this term is still going to be big. And this term is going to be zero on the other side. They're not going to be equal. Now, what happens when x is one? Or, well, I meant to say fraction, sorry, I meant to say fractional part of x and fractional part of x. So now, what happens when fractional part of x is very, very close to 1? It's not equal to 1, but it's very, very close to 1. So it's very, it's approaching 1, let's say. Well, then, this side is going to be very close to 10,000. Well, this side is not going to be that much bigger. It's still going to be this, which is going to be, which we found earlier to be less than 100. So this side is going to be very, very close to 10,000. And this side is going to be smaller than 10,000. So what happens is that there's exactly one value from this range, which they're going to be exactly equal. And this might be a little confusing. And this is where we're going to use the third technique, graphing, in order to help figure this stuff out. Let's just make a nice graph here, because that's, that's going to be a lot more intuitive, especially with this weird logic we're doing here. So over here, I, I'm just going to graph this, or this quantity on, the, on, on our graph. So it's going to look something like this, this, this. So on, and you, the slope is going to be very, very, very high, but it's going to reset every one because it only depends on the fractional part. And also, we can uh, we can draw. If you want to be precise, you can draw the hole here. Technically, you know, it's not actually. If you want to be precise, but it doesn't really matter. And then this would be x equals zero. So what we're going to do is construct the, the graph. What is the graph of x squared? Well, that's just a simple parabola, right? What's going to happen is, as you can see, they intersect at the origin, 0, 0. And each time, for each of these lines, or this is not entirely a good picture, I just realized. <laughs> Not a very good picture. Yeah, let's let's make this picture a little bit more accurate. So we've got that there. And then we we have fractional part. Oh, never mind. That, that was fine. I I don't know why I did that. And then it's going to be a lot, it's going to be a lot uh, more flat than that. It's going to be something more like this. Because this is all the way at 10,000, this y coordinate. So it's, it's going to only hit this at 100, negative 100 and 100, the x squared. But as you can see, it's going to keep hitting these lines. One of these lines, it's going to, this graph of x squared, it's each of these lines exactly once. And as we saw, there's already no solution for 99. But let, let's let's move this down. It turns out there's going to be a solution for everything else in between. So we can keep drawing lines, and I'm not going to draw all of them, of course, but until all the way till here. If I draw all of them, that would be like a, a three-hour video. So it will all the way till 99. We can continue this graph. We already saw that 99 doesn't work. The reason being, it's kind of just going to just miss it. The reason being is they intersect at this hole. As you can see there, right? We found out they intersect when fractional part of x equals 1, which happens here. But that's not possible. But everything else is going to intersect perfectly, as, as you can see by the graph. 
So therefore, we're going to have exactly one solution for each, va each value of floor of x between these two quantities. And to count that, that's pretty simple. Negative 1 to negative 100, 100 values. 1 to 98, 98 values, and 0. So 199 values in total. So there's kind of two ways to look at that. This is kind of the intuitive graphical way, and this is kind of the formal intermediate value theorem, if you know what that is, way. So that's why sometimes graphing is easier because it's much more intuitive. And as you can see, this it will hit everything, but over here it hit the whole, which is why it doesn't count. But over here, for every other point, it just hit a, it actually hit part of the line. Even at negative one hundred, if if you can see, it's not it's not going to hit at the whole because of the fact that negative one hundred, because of the fact. Let's just take an ex just to see why negative 100 won't hit at the whole. Because if you have negative 100 and then you add a fractional part of 1, that squared is not going to be less than 10,000. So it's not, it's, it's not, you don't need that high. It's not, you don't need to have, uh, you don't need to, it's not going to hit at the point where the fractional part of x is equal to 1. It's going to hit at some point where the fractional part of x is somewhere in between 0 and one. Okay, let's now take a look at this problem over here. We've got this equation here. We're asked to find how many integers n satisfy. So for this, in the previous problem, we had x and then floor of x, or fractional, or yeah, floor of x, and then we saw a nice way to combine it and use our handy fractional part substitution. But in this problem, it's not that useful because, you know, we got floor of root n, we don't really have root n anymore. So trying to deal with fractional parts is just going to make it more complicated. Here, it was useful because we just got rid of two terms and made them one term. But here, it's not, not really that good. So we're going to use our third strategy, if you remember, which is to use an inequality. So the thing about, if you remember from earlier, Floor of x is always going to be less than or equal to x. It's, it's always going to be less than or equal to x, which has to be less than floor of x plus 1, right? Because if this is 3.5, it has to be greater than or equal to 3, but less than 4. And let's do this thing, but instead of x, let's write square root of n. Cool. Square root of n. Take a look here. We've already got the floor of the square root of n. So that was kind of the motivation here. We have the floor of the square root of n, but the floor of the square root, and then this ugly thing on the left-hand side, that's hard to deal with, but in inequality, so much simpler. So rather than dealing with this floor thingy, just get an inequality and we're good. And now the thing is we can substitute this in. But n plus 1,000, divided by 70, and less than or equal to square root of n, less than this thing plus 1, which is n plus 1070 divided by 70. So is any n that satisfies this equation a solution? Unfortunately not, because is any positive integer n that satisfies this inequality solution? No. Why? Because let's say this was, I don't know, 3.5. And then let, let's say this was 3.2. I'm talking about this. And this was 4.2. Take a look. This inequality is satisfied indeed. But this thing will be 3.2, the floor of the root of root of n. But you can't have the floor of something be 3.2. So that's kind of our final restriction here, and that this thing has to be an integer. This thing has to be an integer. Because if this is not an integer, then that's not going to work. Floor is always an integer by definition. So what must be true for this to be an integer? Take a look. 1,000. If, if we subtract off 980, we get 20. So 1,000 
is 20 mod 70. Therefore, in order for this to be an integer, n has to be 50 mod 70. So that's kind of our final last restriction here, n is 50 mod 70. So anything that has n equals 50 mod 70 and satisfies this inequality is going to work. Then I'll take a look at this inequality and of course, first thing, probably, probably thought of this already. Let's just multiply by 70. No more denominator dealing with stuff. Just deal with one nice, simple inequality. 70. One thousand. Oh, oops. Seventy. And that should be a less, strictly less than, less than or equal to. So now let's take a look at the first part, and just square it. It's that simple. Ten plus one thousand squared, less than or equal to forty nine hundred, which is seventy squared times n, and squared minus two thousand n plus a million. And write 10 to the 6. Uh, I don't want to write all less than or 4900. And then actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, it's probably this way. If we square it, we're going to have some really large numbers. So instead, let's do a nice clever substitution. Let's call m root n. And then now we would get m squared plus 1000 less than or equal to 70m. And now you can see this is so much simpler because now we don't have to square terms. We can just solve for m itself. So now we get m squared minus 70m plus 1000 less than or equal to zero. And this is so much simpler. It's just a simple factoring exercise. And for this to happen, what must happen? m has to be between. 20 and 50, or square root of n ranges from 20 to 50, i.e. n ranges from 400 to 2500. But that's just our first inequality. Second one, similar, but this time it's a little bit more annoying. This time we're gonna have to use the quadratic formula, but that's okay. Find the roots of this because it's I don't I don't think there's an easy way to factor this. Nothing that I'm aware of. Quadratic formula, it is 4900 minus 4 times 1070, that's 4000, 4280. So then we got 620 on inside the square root. So 35 plus or minus the square root of 155. Okay, so now that this is a possible value for square root of n. But because it's zero is greater than, either m has to be bigger than this, bigger than 35 plus root 155, or less than 35 minus root 155. So we need something that satisfies both of the inequalities. Let's rewrite this in inequality form. And greater than or equal to 400, less than or equal to 2,500. Over here we have either n is greater than 35 minus root 155, or or either n is less than this, or it's greater than this. And by n, I mean square root of n. So now we, this, this is a little bit tricky because we need to approximate or try and approximate square root of 1, 5, 5. And to get around this, we really want n, not square root of n. So let's just square both sides. Or maybe we, maybe you can just try and approximate root 155 without squaring and see what that gives us. 
So 12 squared is 144, so this is clearly more than 12. 13 squared is 169. So it's going to be somewhere in between those two ranges. And there's actually some really cool trick that I know about square roots, and, it's, and let me just briefly explain it to you. It's, it's a really cool trick. So let's say the square root of 155, it's bigger than 144. So what we do, but 144 is 12 squared. So this is going to be approximately 12, but then we're going to add, we're going to add the fraction, so 155 minus 144, that's 11, 11 over 2 times 12. So we take 12, we double it, we put that in the denominator, and then we take the difference of this and 144, and we put that on top. And this is actually derived from binomial theorem, and it's a really good approximation of square root of 155. This is 12 plus 11 over 24. And put this into a calculator, you'll see how close these, uh, the, this approximation really is to the value we just calculated. It's going to be very, very close. I just put it in, it's off by 0 0.008. So this is a really, really good estimate. So 12 plus 11 over 24, nice, that's cool. So square root of n less than 35 minus, 35 minus 12, that's 23 minus 11 over 24, roughly. And then square root of n is greater than 35 plus this, so 47, plus 11 over 24. I'll just rewrite this as 22 plus 13 over 24. So now let's just square these both. So n will now be approximately 22.5 squared. We can do 22.5 squared. Well, we can just use a squaring last digit in five trach. So this is a little bit of a computational problem, but we get this using 22 times 23 and then add 2, 5 to the end. By the way, I have a squares video for you who don't know these tricks, which are really important. So n is roughly less than 506. And of course, this is just an estimate. It's going to be a little bit more than this. But, but it's, it's good enough. It should be good enough, I think. And over here, we have 47.5 squared, roughly. And by our similar logic, 47 times 48. Let's see, what is 47 times 48? Well, 47 squared is 2, 2, it's going to be 2, 2, 0, 9. So then 2, 2, 0, 9 plus 47, that's 2, 2, 5, 6. So 2, 2, 5, 6, 0. 0.25, that is the value of 47 squared. 47.5 squared. So it's going to be here. So now we just take a look going to be bigger than 400, less than 506, roughly. So we got, what, what is, remember we have this as well. So the smallest value that's, uh, that is 400, which will work. So 400 does work, and we can plug it in and check. So 400, let's just write out all our values. 400, a big check mark there. Now what about 470? 470 falls in the range. Big check mark. Or 540, too big, doesn't satisfy this. Now on the other side of the spectrum, what do we have? Well, what is the n, n equals 50 mod 70 values that we can look at? So the largest possible value is going to be, let's see, what, what is it gonna be? So 70, 2800 is a multiple of 70, 280 is a multiple of 70, we subtract them, 2520 is a multiple of 70, but therefore 2500 is going to be 50 mod 70. 2450 divided by 70, you can do, you can calculate that. You'll see that it's divisible, and you can plug it in here as well. This is 50, and this is 50 as well. 2500 is what works. Now, what about 2430? Now, 2, 4, 3, 0 will also work because it's still within our range. What next? 2, 4, 2, 3, 6, 0. Again, within our range. 2, 2, 9, 0. Within our range. 
2220. Uh-uh, too small. So we've basically got all our solutions here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Our answer, six, and we're done. So this is a, again, a, by the way, don't feel bad if these problems are difficult. There's a reason that this is in the advanced topic section. This and this problem, they're both number 25, Sony. These are not easy problems by any means. So if, you, if you're even understanding to this point, that's already great. So the, let's summarize the key ideas for this problem. The, the main trick here was writing the inequality. And then after that, noticing this clever substitution, m equals root n, then we squared, we got solved our equations. We use our cool little mental math squared approximation trick. Although the reason it didn't really matter is because we only really care about within 70. So even if we're off by a little bit, if you didn't know this trick, what you could do is you could just square this, then approximate from there, whatever works, but it's a little bit of computation regardless. This is just a quick way of doing it. And then after that, we just look at our possible values that satisfy the inequality, and then that's it. And you can check out all these practice problems in, the, in this PDF, Mastering HC 1012 book. It's a free book. You can click on the link in the description. Next time, we're going to talk about floor, about inequalities. You can check out inequalities video over there.